Okay, you should be seeing this big blue screen with kind of a star on it. Yes, it's beautiful. Let's see if I can hide some of this. Okay, there's the big open spaces. We did this trip in August of 2010. And it was a Friendship Forest trip. We have a club in Dallas and we visited the club, the club in Great Falls, Montana, which is the central Montana club. And uh, it is pretty much in central Montana. Um, as we were driving up, uh, we, we had a week first in Northern Colorado and then drove up to uh, Billings. And there is an interstate from Billings to Helena to Great Falls. And I had two passengers with me whom you'll meet a little bit later, but um, Zia, said to me, well, you better stay on the interstate. We need to go through Helena. I don't know, no, no, Zia, it's a straight shot to Great Falls. Won't be any problem. You know, there's, there's Zia here, uh, this fellow right here from Iran, my other uh, friend, Ava from Hungary. Um, so, she looks just like one of the Gabor sisters. She does, we call her Ava <laughs> Gabor all the time. <laughs> we certainly do, you got that right. So I said, we won't have any problem, don't worry. <laughs> so this is what our road looked like on the way to Great Falls. <laughs> Pretty much uh, the couple of hours that it took to drive from Billings. So we did not have traffic. And uh, we saw this on one of the uh, um, pickups that uh, we passed, Montana, the last great place. And it is a great place. It's the fourth largest state after Alaska, Texas, and California. So it's pretty big. Uh, we stopped just for a moment in Billings at the visitor center there. And of course, they wanted to tell us all about the Lewis and Clark expedition, which we were going to see more about in um, uh, Great Falls as well. So of course, they were the ones who opened up Montana back in the 1800s. And we'll hear a lot about them in a moment. So this is uh, just some pictures and a little, little detail of it where they have the river and various things from the journals along in these uh, posters there. So going up, uh, coming up to the mountains, lots of um, harvesting going on, uh, but it's pretty wide open. Don't see too many cars or too many people. But coming into Great Falls, we have a nice welcome rainbow to greet us. So Great Falls was, uh, the city of Great Falls was started by Paris Gibson in 1883. He uh, knew that there were waterfalls there. We're going to come back to how he all knew all about all that in just a minute. But anyway, he did, he and his friend decided to take advantage of the uh, waterfalls and build power stations there. And by 1900, it was a thriving city and Anaconda, Anaconda proper mines and grain milling were there. Uh, Anaconda's um, big stack, uh, smokestack was the landmark in the city. So as you go through Great Falls, you see Paris Gibson's name everywhere. Uh, he, he wanted to take advantage of this. This first settlement was pretty meager, but uh, they pretty quickly built this as a high school and then a junior high, and now it's a community center. The Gibson High School, the, it's Gibson Square, Gibson Park, Gibson, everything. So this is named after the founder, Paris Gibson. But of course, he knew about this place because of the Lewis and Clark expedition, which preceded him. So the, Louisiana was sold to us by the French who needed a little cash uh, in 1803. Thomas Jefferson took him up on that offer and doubled the size of the United States, but he didn't know what he bought. <laughs> so uh, he enlisted two, two of his uh, generals, Lewis and uh, Meriwether Clark, uh, to go on an expedition. They did a lot of research on it. Uh, <clears throat> they figured out how to be, uh, to doctor people. I had, because they weren't taking a doctor, they had a, a whole uh, expedition of 33 people. So it was a big operation to get this all uh, done to start from St. Louis, going up the Mississippi and to really chart everything past Fort Mandan. They, they pretty much knew who these Indians were up to this point. But this was uncharted territory up in here. And you see how they went one way, uh, got into the Yellowstone, the Snake River, and Columbia, all, all the way to the coast. Uh, Jefferson charged them with finding a way to uh, a navigable waterway, which turned out not to happen, to the West Coast to see what was there to chart the flora and fauna. And um, they did all that and kept excellent records. 
Of the 33 people, they only lost one person, which was very uh, good for an expedition, but they did find out uh, what was on the Missouri, came back another way, which didn't really help them much. <clears throat> So in the Lewis and Clark um, Hall, there is this statue of them. And we see York, who was a black man, who was the uh, servant to uh, Clark, to um, Clark, yes. And uh, the dog, the Newfoundlander, uh, Seaman, uh, Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, and the Indian woman who was their guide, uh, uh, Sakajawea or Sakajawea, whichever way you want to pronounce it, and her baby on her back. And we'll hear more about all these cast of characters as we go on. So they're the ones who came up the river along with these, uh, this party of 33 people, the Missouri River. This statue is, was done by Bob Schreiber, one of two that he did. He did this one for the centennial of the state in 1989, but it's along the banks of the uh, river. You can see it if you uh, walk along there. So this is a map of where they went. And as you can see the different Indian tribes and different markings along here where they went. Came back another way, tried that, that didn't work too well. But it was tough, and especially when they came to the five big falls on uh, the Mississippi where Great Falls, Montana is located right now. And the Lewis and Clark Museum has everything you could possibly want to know about, the, about this expedition. And I was fortunate enough also to visit Fort Clatsop at the end of it on the Columbia River and got the story from the Columbia River end of it on another trip. So this is my host, uh, Pam, who was uh, hosting me in Great Falls and showing us the expanse of this big river here. And then the Lewis and Clark Museum is built right along the river where you have a view of it. We had a guide that showed us around. And right here you see uh, them hauling this canoe up the, the bank, which is another view of it. <laughs> So they had to portage around these to a tune of 25 miles hauling their canoes around these falls. And in, there were cliffs in some places, so it was really difficult uh, getting them up, got, getting them up and down. They tried a different kind of canoe that didn't work too well. So they spent about a month in this region altogether. And you see some of the rapids uh, and, and uh, more information about it. Uh, here's one of the portage places and then rolling it along, crossing the prairie expedition style. They weren't necessarily planning on all that. So here is what Jefferson told them. The object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and its course and its communication with the waters of the Pacific. And that they did, did, they did find a route to the Pacific. They may not have fa ever found it had they not come across Sagajawea. She was a Shoshone uh, Indian woman, probably in a teenager, probably about 15, 16. She had been kidnapped from the Shoshone tribe by another tribe and, quote, married off to the um, French fur trader, uh, Toisant Charbonneau. And in 1805, she gave birth to a baby son. This was while Lewis and Clark were there. But since she spoke Shoshone, uh, they enlisted her and several other Indians as well. They enlisted her to come with them on this trip and be their guide. She do, did know some roots and uh, be kind of um, a helper to them to uh, approach other Indian tribes so that they knew they weren't being invaded or uh, you know, that there was another Indian with them and could help them and to get uh, stores that they needed and things like that. So she was a really huge help to them and told them what would run through and what would not. The museum itself is really interesting. It has a lot of beautiful uh, artifacts from the Indian culture and the um, natives there. These buffalo that are decorated are pretty popular in Western museums and Western towns. Uh, while we were uh, in there uh, in Great Falls, we also visited. I visited four of the dams that are on the Mississippi, on the Missouri. And this, these are some things to know about this area. It's about this ten-mile stretch where the, the river drops about 612 feet, and that's a lot. Now these aren't going to add up to 612, but they but they are some big waterfalls in place. And the rest of what's missing from the 612 is just this gradual um, rapids that runs between them. 
So all together, these uh, take up about 10 miles. And the falls are even uh, represented on the state seal of the state of Montana. So this is one of them, Rainbow, Rainbow Falls. And of course, dams were built on all five of these falls for electric power. Another one, uh, and I'm not sure if it's Crooked Falls or Coulter Falls. Those are the two that I can't place exactly. Big Falls is at Ryan Dam. There is also an island at one of them, Payne Island, which has a state park on it. And the river divides there. We did go there, but there's not a lot to see except hiking trails. The Black Eagle Falls Dam and Power Station. You see the power station back here and power lines. <clears throat> And just along the Missouri River, uh, you might think this is a canal that would uh, let traffic go by, but it's not. There's just, it's just a small island that's there in the river. There are too many cliffs along there, and a lot of the Missouri goes through mountains. So there might be a place here and there that you might be, be able to get around the falls, but really the river is not navigable as far as getting to the Columbia. Here's one place along Rainbow Falls where they had a landslide, uh, two different views of it that were in the paper at that time. There are paths along the river and it's a historical area and there are markings along that give you different uh, historical events that happen. Like there's a sulfur spring that um, Sacagawea was treated with sulfur water when she became very ill. But a lot of the river also has cliffs along it and uh, you know beautiful uh, plants, wildflowers and uh, swallows nests up along these cliffs. There's a lot of birds come through this area too. Right in town, there's Giant Springs State Park. And that looks like this. Uh, and there is a Giant Spring here. And it's kind of an interesting place. This is the Row River. It's all of 200 feet. And it's the shortest river in the United States in Guinness Book of World Records. And it has a big spring in it, which is looks like this. And it's the biggest freshwater spring. So this river is it's a spring-fed river and it flows into the Missouri just right where it starts pretty much. Mm. It's very, very clear. You can see the bottom of it uh, because of this clear spring water. So this is the Roe River uh, flowing into the Missouri. And right alongside of, of that is the Giant Springs Hatchery, this fish hatchery. And it was interesting to see your fish, uh, Jack, because uh, they started raising fish here to, uh, to um, stock these different lakes and rivers. You see the different kinds of salmon and trout and so forth and places where they have put these fish in different lakes through the state. So they're uh, grown to be little ones and bigger ones and stock these lakes. So I said it's also famous for having uh, the birds fly through here, not only the swallows, but also uh, all kinds of other birds uh, because it is on this major flyway. <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of them come through Texas and uh, as well. And of course they have the, the Canada geese. These are some, not, not the real ones, but they're statues outside of the Montana Fish and Wildlife Park. And that gives you a little idea of what kind of animals are around the area. And of course, once you get out west, you get grizzly bears as well as others and they, and um, the expedition did run into a grizzly bear when um, one of the, uh, I can't remember if it was Lewis or Clark, but one of them shot um, a buffalo and uh, started and put his rifle down and went to go uh, take some meat off of it. And a grizzly bear also had the same idea for dinner. And uh, he had left his rifle <laughs> leaning against a tree somewhere and had to run for it. He said, never do that again. <laughs> But there's all kinds of wildlife in the area, the big uh, hunting area. And these I found quite amusing. I think you will too. Um, some of the people on private property who don't want visitors. The other famous person who is who comes from Great Falls is Charles Russell or Charlie Russell as he's well known. <clears throat> He came out here first as a young man. I think he was probably 15 or 16 years old. He was kind of incorrigible in school, never could keep his mind on his work, was always doodling pictures, you know, the kind. And his, his father decided he would send him out west for the summer to work as a cowboy. And 
and that would just cure him and, and get, his, get him focused on his studies. He was from St. Louis. So um, when he got out there, he just loved the cowboy life. It really backfired. That plan backfired. He never came back. He loved the cowboy stories, and he started making, uh, writing down some of these cowboy stories that he heard around the campfire and making drawings, these little doodles that he loved to do, and ended up staying in, in Great Falls and becoming uh, one of our primary Western artists. So he lived there, as I said, and was, was known as a cowboy artist. He, his home is there. There's a museum to him, his home where he lived, and his studio. We went through the museum tour with this guide and she was uh, telling us about him. And uh, she's, his wife, he did marry, uh, he married um, Ellen, Ellen Cooper. And uh, she, she was, with, pardon me? And she was his um, uh, agent and she had a good business head and got prime money for these paintings that he was doing. And so he did over 2,000 different paintings. He was very prolific, but she got top dollar for him. And our guide said, our, you know, we have a lot of his work here in this museum, but if you want to see his best work, you're going to have to go to Fort Worth. And, and of course, we knew all about the Fort Worth paintings and the two collectors in Fort Worth were Eamon Carter and Sid Richardson, who had uh, oil and, and um, cattle money. And they both have museums now in, in Fort Worth, the Eamon Carter American Art, and the Russell's there. And the Sid Richardson Museum is right downtown Fort Worth. If you're ever in downtown, it's a two room museum with one room full of Charlie Russell's and the other full of Remington. So that's what they collected. And indeed his best work is in, is in Fort Worth. So we were proud of that, that, uh, that Texans had some of it. So this is one of his famous paintings about Lewis and Clark meeting the Flathead Indians. <clears throat> and it, they're not the um, middle of the picture where you might think, but way over here on the side. So here's the detail from it, uh, where we have the Shoshone guide, old Toby, and the Lewis and Clark right here in the hats and looking on and York is holding the, the statues. Sacagawea is, is here in the foreground. So they are uh, apparently talking about ways uh, through, through the Shoshone uh, Indian territory <clears throat> from one of his paintings. So it's interesting to look at his paintings because they all tell a story about something. So here's his studio, you see a log cabin and when you walk, walk into it, it's just like he left it to go have some lunch and he'd be right back because everything is just the way he left it. And of course, he did have his friends that he liked to have a beer with, and uh, uh, he loved the storytelling. He wrote uh, some books, too, with Western stories in that you can buy. But here's one of his paintings right on the easel. His brush is out just like he's going to come back. So he married Nancy Cooper, and uh, she set him up and made him rich and famous. And this was the days of the Wild West shows, and he knew famous people like Will Rogers and Douglas Fairbanks. This is late 1890s. Uh, and uh, they were uh, um, very popular at that time. <clears throat> when he died in 1826, of course, the whole town uh, closed down and uh, his uh, cortege came through town uh, and it, all, the, all the streets were lined with the, the school children and all the, the people from, uh, from town because he was their most famous citizen. So this was his house right next door to his studio, little Victorian house. And I have pictured small rooms, but I won't bore you with all of them. You'll kind of get the idea of uh, a very nice house of men who made some money. And more from the museum. Um, there are all kinds of things besides his paintings. This is again, my, my host Pam uh, in the Charlie Russell Museum. Things that people have collected from the West different collections and different things about the Indian tribes. And some of the artwork is just really beautiful uh, of the Indian uh, artwork. Uh, this of course be on a deer skin or some kind of animal skin. <clears throat> the buffalo of course has played a big part in Indian life and we'll see more about that as we get into this. Uh, like at Custer, South Dakota, they like to work with the buffalo in painting it or decorating it. There are a lot of those around. So as I said, the buffalo was a big part of Indian life and the first people's buffalo jump state park is where you really 
get a hold of that idea. Uh, this is a cliff where people ran buffaloes off it and called it the buffalo jump. This painting comes from the museum in Helena, but it's what would look like. If you're the Indian there, you need to watch out <laughs> because uh, you might get pushed off. But this is what they did. They ran them off the cliff, they broke their necks and they just gathered them up. And buffalo, uh, this is the real thing, looking over the cliff. Uh, <clears throat> in the visitor center there, it gives you an idea of how the Indians use the buffalo. They didn't throw anything away. The meat is what you think of first and maybe the hides but they used everything. Uh, and when the buffalo began to be hunted by white people settling in the West, this was really a tragic thing for them because that was their life. And you see the, the range of the buffalo, once this train went through, it really sliced that um, uh, buffalo range in half. And not only was there uh, hunting of the buffalo and the white men would leave just carcasses, you know, thousands of them on the plane, shoot them just for fun. And for the Indian, this was just a sacrilege. But not only that, they'd had a drought before that. So they were, were already having problems with this drought. And uh, then the, when the whites moved in, it really um, was a disaster. This is a view inside the visitor center. <clears throat> And these are paintings on the walls and then they set up in front of them some of the uh, actual things like teepees and uh, things that you could look at. And some of the buffaloes, some of it painted and some uh, just uh, set in front and some of the other wildlife in the area. <clears throat> they also had a display of what the Indian tribes were that were in this area. And you see the different ones, the Asinawan, Blackfeet, Chippewa Cree, um, another Chippewa, uh, read all of it, uh, Kianai, Crow, Southern China, Cheyenne. If you think you're missing the Sioux, uh, they were farther east and they're, they're, the Sioux covers a number of different tribes, including, including the Lakota which, Sioux, which are the most well known, but there are a number of Sioux tribes east of this area. So our next stop was to visit a Hutterite colony. Now you may be not familiar with the Hutterites. There, if you are, if you know the Amish and uh, uh, Mennonites and some of those other kinds of groups, um, it would be similar to that in that they came originally from Germany and sp still speak a German language and have colonies of their own. Usually, about 100, 150 people. Once they get too too big, they will split off and form another one. The Hutterites are mainly along the northern U.S. border into Canada, and they're farming communities. They, what's different from them is that they um, do use modern machinery and equipment. They do have tractors and milking machines and that kind of thing. They sell milk and cheese and produce in town. <clears throat> they do dress in the old ways, though. You see some of the um, ladies cleaning out the milking machines. They do raise uh, beef cattle and um, as I see, they're a dairy farm as well. <clears throat> but they do speak English. Their children just go through the eighth grade and their, their eating is community. Uh, they have separate houses, but they don't have kitchens in them. Everybody uh, eats communal, in a communal uh, kitchen and uh, dining room. And they rotate these different jobs. So they, these uh, women might, might, and men have different jobs through the through the year. And when the men come in for lunch, they hang up their hats. This is two people from our group. The men are always served first, of course, then the children, then the ladies. And does that sound familiar? Uh, but we were guests there for lunch. And uh, I'm sure we paid them something for that and for the tour. But uh, anyway, we did eat there. Uh, I did get a little glance at some of the children. They weren't too happy about having their picture made. But they're, they're, they're schooled through the eighth grade and they do speak German, those, those, some of them do speak English as well. And this was the uh, head of this particular colony who was the father of the English speaking guide that we had, young woman, on his tractor. Uh, the Sluice Boxes State Park was another place my, my um, host took me on a day off, a, day, a free day that we had, and just a really pretty place to visit with a waterfall and uh, light, lots of hiking trails and cliffs and you know, just a really pretty place up in the mountains that's nearby.
So we had it one day to go to Helena. Our trip took us alongside the Missouri River. The highway ran alongside the river. These are not the best of pictures. They're um, not my favorites, but they're all I have. Uh, this particular thing, when we got to Helena, we visited the state capitol, which is one of the very, very pretty, one. it's pretty ones. It's been restored and um, has some interesting things to see in it, particularly artwork of Charlie Russell, which should, shouldn't surprise anybody. But this is the grand staircase that you see when you walk in. And this uh, picture up here is the completion of the railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, which opened up the West. And of course, this, the, the beautiful stained glass windows. But even the corridors, the uh, railings, everything is uh, you know 1890s, and very, very pretty. So in the House of Representatives, you see the Lewis and Clark expedition done in uh, silver. Ooh. And in the uh, Senate, there is a picture of uh, Charlie Russell's uh, painting, a uh, huge one up above. This is the one we saw with uh, one of the ones, a similar one to one, one we just saw. And looking down from the balcony. <clears throat> There's some people, famous people from Montana. You might remember Senator Mike Mansfield. And of course, Montana is known for uh, being the first state to allow women to vote. And we can thank Jeanette Rankin for that. She's from Montana. So in, uh, when we finished with our tour of the Capitol, we had a little tour of the town, uh, but we were rounding up people and I had a chance to duck into the Historical Society Museum very quickly. And of course there are lots of cowboys and Indians featured there as you would imagine, showing uh, the Indian life of that, that time. and also uh, what some of the uh, early settlers uh, might have looked like. Um, this you're gonna see again a little bit later, a bear trap. <laughs> That's something you wanna keep clear of. Um, it, it has a picture of one of the glaciers in Glacier Park. And this, this photo was from 1923 and already the glaciers had been receding. So it isn't only the um, climate change that's causing this, so it's probably uh, going faster now but even so, uh, in the late 1890s, it was uh, receding. But people like to come out and visit the glaciers, um, even though they were, they were not developed at that time into the national park. So this is what the, some of these Victorian houses look like, and a little model of what the uh, Glacier Hotel looked like. And a, a chuck wagon from the cowboy days, and of course, more, more about Charlie Russell. I know this is a little hard to see, so I made, a, made that a little bigger for you. He says, to have talent is no credit to its owner. What man can help you should get neither credit nor blame for it. It's not his fault. I'm an illustrator. There are lots of better ones, but some worse. Any man that can make a living doing what he like is lucky, and I'm that. Anytime I cash in now, I win. So some of his paintings are also in this museum. Our, our tour was in this little uh, faux train with a little uh, car, open cart behind it. And we had a tour around the city, uh, the Masonic Temple, one of the churches, um, some of the artwork. I'm especially interested in the architecture of the city. A lot of it is back from the 90s, gay 90s. Mm -hmm. You'll be interested to see where the governor lives. No big palace for the governor of Montana. He lives just in a tract house. We took a little trip out to the Last Chance Gulch Road. The Last Chance Gulch was, as you can believe, where they were looking for gold and didn't find it until the last day they said, if we don't, we'll try one more place. If we don't find gold out here, we're leaving. And they did find gold out here. So there are miners houses along this road, miners cabins that are still there and have been turned into all kinds of other things. But they did find gold, but it was out from town a little bit, from Helena. The Gates of the Mountains was a boat trip we took on the Missouri while we were down in Helena. This little map right here, I'm gonna blow up for you to show you about where it is if you wanna go out there. It, Helena would be here and if you come up here along the Missouri, 
there's a little lake there that you can catch a boat uh, like this that will take you down the, the Missouri River, which is a very pretty little day trip. And as you can see, we've had really good weather that, that week, that whole week was very nice. And the gates of the mountains are, are just that, they're, they're like huge gates on either side, big cliffs. And I particularly put this one in so you can see how, how big these cliffs are compared to the boats that are along there. They're really high. And it, they called it Gates of the Mountains because they thought the river had ended as they went down this all, all the, along these cliffs and it seemed to just end, but it made a sharp turn and it fooled them. So this is a family who's looking at some of these Indian um, petroglyphs along the sides of the paintings, a little close up of it. Uh, not much that you can see right now. The geology is interesting in that area because this was all an inland lake at one time. And this mud oozed up and it just folded over in places. The mountains were formed first and then the river. It kind of uh, filled in its low spots. So the geology of the area is very interesting. So this is the place where they thought the river had ended. It was just dark and it looked like there was nothing there. But in fact, it did make a turn. And this is where we made our U-turn and went back, but, but it did go on from there. So our Glacier National Park was our other uh, day out. And that is a beautiful place. We didn't try to see all of it. You really can't. You come in from this way up to St. Mary's Lake and um, go about this far. When I was in Glacier before, we stayed at uh, near Whitefish and did the Road to the Sun also to Logan Pass, which is about halfway or a little more than halfway. And, and you see um, Waterton up here, which actually runs down below uh, the US border. And that's where we went uh, after the, this week was over. So Glacier Park um, is named, of course, for all the glaciers that are there, which are, of course, dwindling right now. It has the three visitor centers at the entrances and Logan Park. You need a pass, not only your park pass, but also a ticketed entry, just like you do so many times. So uh, or a reservation at a campground. And there are a lot of campgrounds that's open only in the summertime, which means that's when all the uh, road work goes on. So as our uh, week with the Great Falls people ended, we got in our car, Ava, Zian, and I, and drove up to Glacier, alongside of Glacier, up to Waterton. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, this is our, uh, th um, I'm ahead of myself. This is our trip to Glacier, first of all. So we stopped in a little town called Choteau, a French Indian name. That's, this is me on the left. And uh, it has- a you on the right. <laughs> on the right now. There's a lot, a lot of old farm equipment and uh, log cabins. Uh, you'll see some dinosaurs, which were in the area at the time. Uh, some, some of the buildings are from the uh, 90s, 1890s. So it was a nice little stop. And we had lunch at the uh, St. Mary's Lodge which gave us a nice, um, and this is supposed to be a grizzly bear, I think, with one of our uh, participants, but a nice view of the mountains from the, from the lodge where we had some lunch. So we've, we've come over here, uh, over here from Chateau and Great Falls up to St. Mary's. So here's St. Mary's Lake and winding roads up to Logan Pass. When I stayed before, we stayed at one of the ski lodges up here near Whitefish and came in through this way, through West Glacier and another beautiful lake. And these, the views out this way are really tremendous. We didn't have as much beautiful scenery and you might disagree when you see the pictures, but um, I, I was more impressed with this view than, when, than with this view. But it does have campgrounds and hiking trails and lots of uh, backcountry. I stole this off their website to give you an idea of what the glaciers looked like back in the old days when you could walk out to them. And a little bit of the wildlife, they have, um, I think it was 71 different kinds of animals and 276 kinds of birds. So you can see lots of things in, wild, uh, in Glacier. Uh, if you're on a tour, you get a little bus like this where you can stand up in these little slots and take your pictures, which I thought was pretty, pretty nice. Uh, and this is St. Mary's Lake as we, we uh, started seeing it for the first time and along the lake. Uh, we did get out and had our group picture made. You always have to have a group picture. The only reason I'm showing it to you is to, to show you how bundled up we are. It's probably 40 degrees. <clears throat> uh, some of these are Great Falls people. This is me bundled up. <clears throat> 
And this lady didn't bring anything other than a light sweater. So she's in my raincoat <clears throat> when she was nearly freezing to death. And what month was it? This is August. August, okay. This is August. So if you go to Glacier, it's high. And uh, this is the road to the sun. As you can see, it's backed up with cars. This is a two lane road and they do their road work during the summer. <clears throat> And of course, you do want them to do that. This is our guide who has to do this every day and is saying, oh, here we go again. So they'll close off part of the road to work on it and let one one way traffic go through, you know, and then 30 minutes later, the other side comes through. You know how that works? So while you're just sitting here waiting for the people to come the other way, you can get out, <laughs> look around, take your pictures, see what's alongside the road, take your close ups. <clears throat> But there really are beautiful views along there. As I say, they, I think they're, be, they're better from coming from the other direction. But there we are. I, 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 this is what I have. Uh, one of the glaciers uh, over here. <clears throat> We're coming up on Logan Pass right here, which would be our highest, highest point um, that the road goes. And there is a visitor center there and trails out behind it. You can get some lunch and things like that. This is actually my favorite picture from Glacier. Mm. Wow. And of course, then as you uh, leave Logan's Pass, you have to come back the way you did. It's, I, I don't know if it's possible to go across in one day. It's a long trip, uh, even doing halfway across. So now uh, we're going to do what I almost jumped on to soon, this additional trip uh, up to Waterton. And I've got about five more minutes, Kathleen. Oh, fine. Waterton Lakes International Peace Park because it does run in from Canada into the United States. And we are alongside of Glacier now driving up to uh, Waterton, up to Canada. <laughs> you come in from the Canada side. And here is the uh, park entrance. <clears throat> so Glacier and Waterton were designated International Biosphere Reserves and recognized as a World Heritage Site, in addition to being the um, um, International Peace Park. So this guy that you see in the poster here was a rancher in the area who uh, wanted to, to set aside this area as a national park, that Waterton be set aside. And it is indeed uh, Canada's fourth national park. Banff, I believe, is first, and I'm sorry that I don't know the other two, but it's also a peace park. And Zia, uh, my, my um, a friend and, and colleague from um, our Friendship Forest Club is from Iran, and he is particularly interested in the Rotary Club, the Sister Cities Club, the International Peace uh, Movement, and um, he's a Baha'i who also uh, support peace movements. So he wanted his picture taken there, and this is just a little close-up of it. So as we, we started uh, seeing the Waterton Lake as we drove then from the um, visitor um, uh, entrance sign. And here we see the, the uh, Prince of Wales Hotel as we saw uh, from Billy. And it's up on a high bluff and has this absolutely great view down the long narrow lake. <clears throat> this is looking from the end of the lake. This is upper Waterton Lake. There's lower Waterton Lake behind me. And there's several other lakes around these mountains. This is the town of Waterton. It doesn't have much of a year round population, around 200, but lots of hotels and restaurants. Um, they get booked pretty early. Of course, they're very pricey. If you intend to stay there, uh, they're very pricey as, of course, the Prince of Wales Hotel. Hi. All right, this is in Waterton Town. We talked about the little falls that's in town. It comes from Camerton, um, Cameron uh, River and Lake, which is um, adjacent to uh, Waterton Lake uh, on the other side of that mountain. But this is in town. <laughs> This is uh, the little marina that they have, and this is the boat that we're going to take, as you, you see uh, docked here. And Waterton, the town of Waterton is just full of deer. They don't seem to have any fear of humans. They, we had a little picnic here in, uh, by the lake and they were just all over. And as we uh, hiked along Cameron Lake, we saw lots of them as well. So here are intrepid hikers, uh, Zia and Ava. <laughs> Cameron Lake and um, Waterton Lake itself doesn't have a lot of trails because the, some of the mountains are just sheer drop right into the lake. And uh, so they're, they're not there, but you can hike it 
at Cameron Lake. We did see some deer, of course, as we went along the little family. Uh, and one of the things, of course, to do is to take the boat um, down to Goat Haunt. So we, we go all the way down the lake and oh, this is the United States over here. Uh, where you walk along here along the lake over to the United States. This is the border. You see you're at the United States border. And the boat's there for about half an hour. And Z, of course, wanted to take the 40 minute hike uh, and wait for the next boat, which was four hours later. But uh, uh, we were going to Montana. I said, I'm going to leave without you. That may seem really mean, but you have to understand that Zia did do that. He, he, was, he would disappear. So if, uh, there are some posters down there. Uh, and I was going to do a close up of some of the international people who um, supported the peace movement. You, you can put your little sticky thing up if you have something you want to do for peace. Also some quotes uh, from famous people, what they do for the peace movement. And again, it's supported by the Rotary Club is one of them. So the Prince of Wales Hotel, as Billy said, is worth going in to look at, absolutely. Uh, it's one of this chain of uh, old hotels that, that are in the national parks, and you've probably been at some. Um, we got off on a tangent before we started here about uh, 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 in some of the other parks, but, but they are, uh, this is one of them to connect the railroad and bring visitors out. So it was a, a railroad project. So we did go in and look around uh, it has this glorious view, uh, the old wood and so forth, the lobby with this floor to ceiling um, windows that you can just look out at the lake. And we went out and back, this is looking down at the lower lake. And it, there's a small area that flows into the upper lake, which is this one with goat haunt at the end of it. There's that little passageway between lakes. And just this family, visiting out there. It's kind of like a scene from The Sound of Music. <laughs> so this is uh, the end of our trip. Um, Ava Gabor, or Ava, <laughs> her with the big sky country. Um, let's see what happens if I share it. Uh, screen sharing. Uh, open parent slides. Let's see if it'll do it. See, no, it will. <laughs> Why would it be? There are just as few slides in here that it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't uh, show. Come well, on. that was amazing. Well, it, you know, they're, they're there. I don't know why they wouldn't show. This is just too weird. I can go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a thing of beauty. And uh, if you're in that area, definitely worth uh, going to see. So I will unshare or get out of this. Stop. Okay, and let's see, we do have some, um, oh, so the hotels that are in the parks, um, Sandra is saying they're run by Fairmont Hotels. Yes, that's true. They, yes, the, the ones that were originally built by the railroad, yes, they're the Fairmont, so. Yeah, okay. Um, um, Town, I think it was called Mountain View. It's about 12 miles out of town toward Lethbridge. Uh, you don't have to go that far, but we stayed at a nice little um, kind of a B&B &B with maybe 10 or 12 rooms or something like that. But it was very nice and, um, you know, it was a lot cheaper. It's like half the price of anything in town. Right. Um, Marcia. So if, if anyone wants, um, I mean, Mary, it was so cool to see all these, all your pictures of Glacier National Park. And we had a member who had, who had written a book and did a program, um, Hugh Grinnell, on his relative who helped map and name. But it was like he had talked about the St. Mary's Lake and um, to see your pictures of it um, on this trip. I came to was that glacier one that he did because I'd been to glacier and, and thought that was a really interesting one. So if, if you haven't seen anybody here hasn't seen it, it's on the, the uh, homestays, evergreen homestays. It's uh, you can see that. 
But uh, it's on the YouTube channel. Right. YouTube. And I mean, I would really suggest kind of watching um, one and then the other, yours again, and then um, yeah. his, um, uh, especially if you're going to go to Montana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Thank That's you fun. very much. If you're going to Montana, you can watch Billy's on Idaho, which is already up too. Uh, he has yes. some pictures from there. It's just right next door. 